being in the delivery of services. Um, I mean, for example, cars, most cars, most people, I guess most people buy cars through dealerships. But and that's not necessarily the way you have to buy cars, but it seems to be a dominant design in the way that the, the car sector sells cars. So dominant design isn't just about products. It could be about delivery of health services. It could be about the delivery of all sorts of financial services, for example. The last model I want to look at is something called the diffusion curve. Um, are there patterns in the way that we see a new idea um, diffused? And if so, what does that mean for marketing, for strategy, um, etc.? So I hope those sorts of questions sound interesting. <laughs> Okay, so I'll say a little bit in general about what, what we're going to be looking at. The models that we're looking at are what you might call dynamic. They're looking at how innovation and technology changes over time. So that means we're looking at dynamic models rather than static models. Okay? I mean, something like Porter's Five Forces takes a snapshot at a particular point in time. So it's a quite a static model, really. If you wanted to get a dynamic version of that, you'd have to take lots of snapshots between now and the Portis Five Forces into the future. So these, these models that I'm going to look at have time and dyna dynamism embedded, embedded in them. Each of the models um, that I, I'm going to talk about can either be grouped in relation to um, the performance of the innovation, i.e. in terms of its improvement in performance. And I'll talk a bit more about what I mean by that. So something about the innovation or they are about diffusion and, and the market. So one is about technology and the innovation itself. The other is about markets. So for example, how quickly it diffuses, um, how, many, how much sales it has, for example. Each of these models can be represented in a cumulative or a non-cumulative way. And I'll show you what I mean by that in a minute. If you if you had sales of um, a product over time, yeah, and you sold one unit in January, two units in February, three units in, in, in March, you could represent that in two ways. One in a non-cumulative way, which shows one, two, three, for months one, two, three. Or you could show it as one, then one plus two, then one plus two plus three. Yeah? So the, there's a non-cumulative way and a cumulative way. And I'll show you an example of that here. This is, a, this is an example of sales of a product over time. This one is non-cumulative, i.e. it just says, this is the amount of sales we had in January, February, March, April. The alternative way of representing that is adding them up over time, so you've got a cumulative. And you end up with very different curves. Yep. So if you, if you accumulate them over time, you often end up with something that looks like an S-curve. Yep. And if you don't accumulate them, you often end up with something that looks like a bell curve. And you've seen, I guess, if you think about the product life cycle, the product life cycle looks like this. Because the product life cycle is normally represented as non-cumulative, i.e. how many you've made sales. But you could easily represent the, not, the product life cycle like this. So these two curves are just different ways of presenting the same data. Now you might say, well, why, why am I boring you with that? And it's because what we'll see as we go through some of these models, some adopt this approach and some adopt this approach. And it's just some background so you, you know where we're coming from. Okay, so the first model I want to look at is something called the technology life cycle. And this basically maps the, the sales volume of a technology or an innovation over time. And actually, this is nothing 
sophisticated. It's simply um, an aggregation of lots of product life cycles. Okay? So if you have lots of products developed under a particular technology, the technology life cycle is simply an aggregation of all those, which is why it looks like um, the product life cycle. An example of a technology life cycle might be um, traditional cameras. Okay, before we had digital cameras, can you remember how we used to use film? Yeah. <laughs> what you would have seen, now this again, this is a non-cumulative, right? It, we haven't, we're not adding them up, we're, we're just saying this is how much we sell at different points. Just like the product life cycle, you have an introduction phase, a growth phase, a maturity phase, and a decline. Okay. What did we see in the camera industry about 10 years ago? Which had radical implications for Kodak. Digital camera. Digital camera. This is a technology life cycle, if you like, of the traditional camera. And you can see this is the life cycle of the digital camera. And it's no coincidence that as this curve rises for sales of digital camera, the sales of the old technology decline rapidly. Okay? So, traditional camera, digital camera. This particular point here is very, very important because it's a basically the transition from one technology to another. Now, why does that matter, do you think? Let's look at the camera industry. Who sells digital cameras? Sorry? Do you say Sony? Sony, yep. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> Everybody, yeah. Kodak does, yep. Yeah. Hewlett Packard. but. Canon, yep. Yeah. Samsung. Samsung. Now what's interesting there is you've got a mix of camera companies, Kodak, Canon. You've also got new entrants, Hewlett Packard, Samsung, Sony. Now, you would never have considered them to be camera companies. So this is important because this has allowed lots of new entrants to come into the market. So basically, the transfer of one technology life cycle to a new one has created, and we'll go back to this term, a discontinuity in the marketplace. It's created disruption. And it's meant that this disruption has meant that many camera companies, like Polaroid, for example, have gone to the wall. And many new companies, like Hewlett Packard, which never made cameras, but now makes, is one of the biggest digital camera manufacturers, has entered the market. So why do you think that might be? What, what opens the door for Hewlett Packard, Sony, Samsung? Brand. Sorry? Probably brand. Um, brand does help, but technology. Technology. technology, yeah. Because with this technology, Kodak, Canon, all these companies had decades and decades and decades of competence building in this technology. Hewlett Packard could never compete with Kodak with the old technology because it didn't have the competence, the technological competence to build cameras, didn't have the skills if you like. Once you move to a new technology, all that competence and all the skills that Kodak had with traditional cameras was completely obsolete. Why would you need to know how to process film uh, and all these other things if now we use digital technology? So when you have this, when you have a new technology, what new technology does is it undermines the competence that made the success of previous companies. So although there, there, there it continues to exist a market for old traditional cameras, the new market is all about digital technology. And Kodak and Canon and other traditional camera companies have had to build up that new technology 
And because they've had to build up that new technology, it has allowed computer companies who have the expertise in digital um, and electrical, uh, electronic technology to come into the marketplace. So transitions are important because they require companies to essentially uh, build new skills. It's like you moving from, if you were a, um, an HR manager and you had to, oh, sorry, if you were an account, accounting uh, account manager and you went into a different department, HRM, you would have to learn a new, whole new set of skills and your old skills may be completely obsolete. It's exactly the same at the organizational level. So you can already see why that might be strategically important. Um, the other thing to say is you can't build skills and competence at the organizational level overnight. Even if you acquire a company, you can't do that. In fact, acquisition is one of the most risky ways of acquiring technology. Uh, when I was at Hewlett Packard back in the 1980s, they had a technology, which I don't know if they have now, but it, it was basically super PCs. Uh, and they were used for CAD CAM, you know, computer-aided design and manufacturing and stuff. So they're very, basically very, very powerful PCs. The number one player was um, Sun Microsystems, which I now I think have been bought out by someone else. The number two, I think, was Apollo, which no longer exists. And the number three was Hewlett Packard. Now, Hewlett Packard bought Apollo, uh, thinking that they could leapfrog Sun. Um, they never did, actually, because it was so difficult for Hewlett Packard to digest Apollo um, that they never actually caught up Sun, and Sun continued to dominate the market. So it's actually very difficult to buy new technology and to um, simply stay ahead of the competition. So this, this kind of transition period is actually very important, not just for people that buy technology, but for companies that produce it. The historical example that's often used is, in our computers we have um, semiconductor chips. Prior to that, if you see these, we see in the old um, sort of black and white programs of computers, and they've got computers that basically fill this room, and they do about as much as this computer here. Well, they use something called valve technology. Um, and the companies that produce valve technology were not the same companies that produce semiconductors. And so what you see is that over time, as we've used new technology in computers, that's often meant that a load of companies have gone bankrupt and died, and new companies have, um, have uh, taken the mantle, taken the baton. So when we're talking about innovation, we often assume that innovation is about creativity and, and, and creating something new. But there's a term, I don't know if you've come across some called Joseph Schumpeter. Joseph Schumpeter is a very famous and influential economist. Um, he had a lot to say um, about entrepreneurship. But he came up with a term called creative disruption. And that is essentially saying creativity or newness creates, is, can, can actually disrupt and, and, and destroy as well as create. And in this particular instance, what we've seen is digital technology has destroyed and removed certain companies um, and sometimes certain sectors. So this is why these tools, these dynamic tools are useful, because they help us think about where the future might be. Um, and given that strategy is about thinking about the future, dynamic models of helping us think about the future are very important. So does that make sense? Yes. Good. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll go home. Um, so that's the technology's life cycle. So that's quite a simple model. It's just looking at different stages, a bit like the product life cycle, um, with sales over time. What I want to do now is shift to, to performance. When we look at the development of a technology or an innovation over time, what does, um, what does the, the pattern look like in relation to the improvement of that performance? Is it a straight line? Um, does it rise very steeply? Any ideas? Sorry? Gradual rise, yeah. Why would that be? You're right, but... 